Um, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Avik Bhattacharya. I am interim director here at the Social Market Foundation, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be able to chair and uh, introduce uh, this discussion um, that we have organised in conjunction with, the, with our friends at the Social Mobility Commission um, on promoting the potential how to improve jobs, boost growth, and unlock social mobility in every corner of the UK. Um, it's a wordy title, but that, I think the gist of it is how do we manage to connect uh, regional economic growth um, to promote an opportunity to promote the social mobility, um, not just kind of driving up in the moment, but also making sure that uh, everybody can benefit from it. So it's it's an absolute delight uh, to be uh, joined by a fantastic panel of speakers. Um, uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get underway. Um, if you haven't noticed, we are streaming live to the internet. So for people on the panel in particular, but people in the audience, um, be aware that your, your words will live on um, in infamy forever on YouTube. So uh, the, uh, uh, be, be, be mindful of that. Um, and we're not expecting a fire drill. There is a fire um, escape outside where you came. Um, there are uh, there are there there's no uh, um, there's no subtlety or no secrets there. Great, fantastic. Um, so I have with me uh, Rob Wilson on my right here, who is a uh, deputy chair of the Social Mobility Commission. We'll kick off with uh, with, with five minutes from him. Um, then we'll have a contribution from Jonathan Gibson, who's joined us from the uh, West Midlands Combined Authority. And finally, we have. Uh, Alison McGovern, um, Shadow Minister for Employment and Social Security, and soon to be trustee of the uh, of the Social Market Foundation. So um, it's a real real pleasure to have you all with me today. So Rob, do you want to do you kick us off um, and give us a perspective from the, uh, the Social Mobility Commission on this uh, big expansive topic? Yes, well, thank you, and it's great to be on the panel with uh, Alison and John and yourself today. Um, it's uh, a really, I don't think social mobility is really racing up the charts as something that everybody is interested in very suddenly. I wonder why. Um, as uh, Avid said, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Social Mobility Commission. And just to tell you a bit about us, we exist in the UK to make sure that uh, the circumstances of, of anyone's birth don't determine their outcomes in life. We're a statutory body, uh, but we're independent. We have seven appointed commissioners and we have a small secretariat sort of doing the day-to-day -day work. Now, one of the things we're asked to publish each year is a State of the Nation report, which gives an overall picture of what social mobility is really like in the UK. And our latest very thorough and detailed report was published in September last year. And it collated a number of key indicators and data um, about social mobility. And what it said is that co contrary to commonly cited opinion, it showed that there's really no convincing evidence that social mobility is in decline in the UK. And there's no convincing evidence that we're in decline either internationally either. So that's the, the positive news, we're not going backwards. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing everything we possibly can to move forwards and try harder to make more progress. But it's very important that within those terms, the Social Mobility Commission speaks to the evidence and doesn't support a decline narrative that's currently not substantiated by the facts. Telling a dismal story on social mobility to people working hard to change their own lives is equivalent to saying, well, don't bother because the data says that you're not going to have any chance of success anyway. And that's unfair and it isn't the case and it's not what the data is currently showing. However, times are always moving on and that could change. However, what does emerge is a very complex and nuanced picture about who is doing well in terms of social mobility. Whichever way you view the data, whether it's ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic, outcomes do vary enormously. For example, in education, women and girls are doing much better than boys and men. Chinese and Indian ethnic minority children are massively outperforming other ethnic minority groups. For example, poor Chinese children are outperforming white middle class children in many respects. There's also a broad socioeconomic picture that suggests that the more disadvantaged 
you are, the harder it is to make that big leap up the ladder. So what we did find uh, is very significant variation in social mobility by geography, and that regional disparities are entrenched quite deeply in some areas. And this has never previously been given sufficient weight against the other factors in our view. For example, it's fairly apparent that if you are disadvantaged, you're better off being born in a poor London borough as opposed to the northeast of England. So just think about this. If you want to get a degree or a professional job, you're likely to get one if you're born in one of the poorer boroughs in London ahead of the middle class uh, person in the northeast. Now, that is extremely thought provoking, I think. And this has meant that we had to do some real thinking about how to translate our research into action. For example, across a number of areas from the family, early years, education, the economy, and most importantly, this time, geography. And one of the areas that we're focusing on is how we grow opportunities. And that means getting the resources, the powers, um, and the conditions required to stimulate opportunities for economic growth across the UK. And I believe economic growth and social mobility are two sides of the same point and that, uh, same coin, and that is therefore a critical part of improving overall social mobility strategy. It offers a path to more employment opportunities, increased wages, and ultimately greater upward mobility. It isn't really fair that people should have to move away from their, their homes to seek better opportunities. And yet that's the reality for many young people in particular. Um, and so we have to try and do something about it. And there are things we can do about it. And there's a role for everybody in addressing these um, challenges, um, including government, including policymakers, employers, schools, universities, local communities, and individuals, and people in this room today and online following the session. We believe that focusing on this is one of the ways to start the drive social mobility to drive social mobility forward. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, and next, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Robinson, who is head of policy and public affairs for the West Midlands Combined Authority. Thank you very much, Mike, and great to see you all here. Um, and so, I think Rob has set up the, the context on where we are nationally on social mobility. We will look a little bit at what's happening in the West Midlands, which is the largest city region outside of London, so it's an appropriate vehicle. And I think some of our dem dem demographic features below that are <laughs> We have Birmingham, which is the youngest big city within Europe. We have the highest number of HE students, sorry, FE students who are in the West Midlands, and particularly who are studying STEM. So we have a kind of latent asset there within the West Midlands region, which is just a sheer scale of the young demographic element of our population. And a question for a combined authority is, well, what is our role in making sure we can harness and utilise that? And there is something Rob said, which is about the link between economic development and, and social mobility. I think you could look at, you know, is economic development a function of social mobility. I think we would see, well, actually, you need you need both. You know, if you don't have the economic opportunities there, how can that kind of latent asset of such a young demographic base proceed into opportunities and so on? But in the combined authority, if we look at skills as one of the key domains, we have seen devolution of adult skills funding right back to our first devolution deal in 2015, where the commitment was to devolve the adult education budget. We have since 2019 spent around £700 million on adult education, and as of the next financial year, uh, we will probably have a budget of over £200 million of expenditure on economic development skills in community. So we are significant players within the region. Um, we, in our devolution deal, the trailblazer deal we negotiated and agreed last year with the government, sought to really build on the extent and depth of adult skills devolution to date to say, could we have going forward the principle that all adult skills provision will be devolved to the combined up? So we could do the, the join up and particularly the tailoring of provision match our local labour market needs. So the types of courses that are being put on reflect the growth in the knowledge intensive business services industry in the huge automotive industry that we have in the West Midlands. 
And so we kind of sought to establish the principle, we've done so much, how can we go further? We have earned, for example, 160,000 more people to level three since 2019 and reduced the number of people without any qualifications by 60,000. So, you know, these aren't kind of small numbers, but adult skills is just one part of the, the devolution landscape. We have a commitment to jointly oversee 16 to 18 technical vocations in the West Midlands with our colleagues in Greater Manchester uh, in a similar place as well, and also thinking about what is the role of combined authority in careers provision. Now, if you think about all of these different leaves, they are currently sat within various other agencies, but our role is to say, how can we kind of bring coherence across that system, both with the DFE, the DWP, and say, let's kind of make more than some of the parts there and really reflect that to match our labour market needs and how to connect that to communities uh, within the region. So again, the direction of travel for the evolution and particularly to DFE is, is very positive. I think with employment support, there is, there is way to go there, but you know, the, the commitment and the conversation has started. But I do think, to your point earlier, Rob, it is not just a story about skills. It is a story about how do you leverage your whole economy. And as a CA, we have significant leaders over transport. We would like more significant leaders over housing. We would like more. And then in the economy, what we do on innovation and business support is to say, you can't just do one thing to create economic opportunities. You need an institution that can wrap it all together and then articulate it as a model to sell it to you know, investors, the private sector, to do the convening. And that's where we would see our kind of main role as well as skills and saying, if you put all of those solutions means together with lots of flexibility locally for how we use them, ultimately that is a kind of recipe we would think for how, you know, with more powers and flexibility over time, we can start making inroads into some of the geographic disparities you have in the pod. Wonderful, thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, and Alison. I think thank you, and um, thanks to SNF for um, this great event. I previously um, did, a, did an event with SNF on social mobility that was similarly well attended and supported. And I think social mobility, in my opinion, is a kind of social market question because what we're really talking about is people not able to get the return on their time in the labour market because of barriers that are holding them back. So for the good of society, how can we make this particular market uh, work better? So I think this is essentially an SMF type issue. And um, I, I think that, um, well, I want to make three points, a social policy point, an economic point and a cultural point. But I think that it's really great to have this focus on geography and to be thinking particularly um, about those labour markets, not just from a UK-wide point of view, but as Rob quite rightly points out, the postcode disparities that exist in our country. I think this is an under-exercise point in British politics, and I'm grateful to the Social Mobility Commission for focusing on that area. Um, so the social policy point, first of all, I think years gone by when we talked about social mobility, the focus would often be on education. And of course that's right. You know, we all know the power of a good education, great. Um, and actually we have had a geographical focus in education policy. I think of the London challenge under the last Labour government. Um, I think we have not recognised for a long time, though I hope, um, especially what we've just heard about the West Midlands, I hope that people are now recognising the employment impact um, that you can have um, positively where people through their job can actually be able to come up in terms of their skills and their abilities um, over time. And that that, that gap um, that we see uh, in people's lifetime incomes can actually be addressed just as much by employment policy as we historically might have thought on ed education mm -hmm. policy. Um, and there are some key um, linking up institutions there. I think of FE colleges being the obvious one, but also in somewhere like the West Midlands has, has incredible institutions in FE and in HE. So I think if we could make um, our education policy work a bit better with our employment policy, we could do really good things. I have no doubt, you know, historically speaking, in, the history of the Labour Party is basically people achieving social mobility through the world of work. So um, I, I hope it's kind of an obvious yeah. point, but I really think if we can uh, focus a bit more on people being able to um, address historic disadvantage through the, the jobs that they do as much as the school they went to, um, we'll get somewhere. 
Um, second mm -hmm. point, the, the economic point on geography. On geography. Um, I, it's, it's, really, it's really stark, the disparities. If you look at the jobs mixes um, in different parts of our country, and the pay rates, you know, there's really big gaps region to region of the kind of jobs that are available. And um, not to make too much of a party political point, but um, we do have a big plan to try to change that through the Green Prosperity Plan um, with, with money allocated for new jobs bonuses to try to get the best out of our work towards net zero in terms of job quality and changing the jobs mix um, where it's needed. You know, I, I think of um, places like where I'm from in Merseyside, where historically you've done a lot of marine engineering, aka mm -hmm. shipbuilding, but those skills are all quite handy if you want to do offshore wind. Um, so getting the investment in the right places can create good quality jobs where we need them. Second point on economic geography, if we are going to address this labour market floor where people have so much of their potential earnings determined by the postcode that they're born in. I think it's really important that every place has an economic plan. And for those places that already have combined authorities, we're, we're seeing that work happen. Um, and that's great, but we can't leave anywhere else. We can't leave anywhere behind. It's not good enough for so much of people's life chances to be determined by the place that they happen to be born in. Um, so I think at the heart of our growth mission and our opportunity mission from the Labour Party's point of view, at the intersection of that is about making sure that every place has a plan to grow and that it's inclusive growth, that everybody sees their chances grow with it. And I could talk for about two hours on it about that. So I will. Yeah. Final, final points, cultural points. Um, you know, I, I think what unites um, the uh, city region, Merseyside, um, that I, I live in and the West Midlands, um, is that sometimes people make assumptions about us because of our accents. And I don't have a particularly strong scout accent, um, apart from uh, when watching the football. <laughs> but we do have to address this issue that mm -hmm. assumptions are made about people culturally. And, you know, I think, aside from the kind of economic impact that this has, it, there does need to be a recognition that the way that people come to different jobs and different opportunities, often their background affects them, class affects people. And, you know, we want everybody in this country to feel respected and have the dignity of a good job and the respect that that deserves. So I think that there's a, there's a wider cultural point. Keir often talks about his own, um, that Keir Starmer, I should say, <laughs> assuming everybody knows. Um, Keir Starmer often talks about the, you know, being from a working class background and understanding the dignity that comes from working class jobs. And I think if we can address that cultural point as well, that, um, you know, we know that historically certain type of people have been listened to in the country, but actually inclusive growth also means that assumptions shouldn't be made about your skills and talents uh, based on your background or your postcode either. Thanks. Um, I believe uh, Scottish accents are deemed more intelligent than average. Mm -hmm. I think I think the system works. You scrap on that. Did your mum tell you that? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's really interesting that we've zeroed in on the, the regional element. This is certainly something that's come out of the Social Mobility Commission's work that perhaps we uh we, we look at other kind of more individual characteristics before we look at um regional uh in, inequalities and obviously that's something that's a key focus and attention from an economic dimension um but when we're talking about geography which um what, what's the appropriate mm -hmm. unit unit we should be looking at should we be looking at regions uh so we're talking about the northeast for example role uh should we be looking at city regions should we be looking at you know, towns a lot of the blog discourse about towns um or are we getting down to the kind of level of neighbourhoods even? What, what's the what's the right way to think, to think about this when we're thinking about um, geographical inequalities? Well, I can tell you at the moment the data is um, only really lets us um, drill down to sort of large county level. So um, I think that we can do better than that. And I think we're trying to do better than that in gathering 
more sources of data to put into our data explorer tool. That's the first advert that today. If you haven't had a look at that, please go and have a look. There's lots of information on there, but we need to drill further down because um, poverty doesn't really um, know any boundaries. So you can find it almost anywhere. London is a very, very wealthy uh, city at the moment. Uh, yet you find pockets of extreme poverty and hardship. And those need to be looked at just as much as the uh, the problems that and the challenges that are faced in the northwest, the northeast, uh, and the Midlands. So um, I think we need to drill down as far as we possibly can. But at the moment, that is difficult because the level of data we're, we're able to get hold of is not good enough uh, and not sufficient enough to make uh, proper determinations about those very, very local situations. Yeah, totally. Thank you for a view of that. So I think. The data on labour markets recently are quite interesting. So I think we, if you look at the West Midlands, we are you know, nearly three million people. The how an individual experiences the economy really varies by your kind of skill level. So if you look at if you're very high skilled, the data is you now there are basically two big labour markets in the West Midlands: one Coventry and work outside the WMC abounding and the other one, Great Birmingham, so it's over black country. But if you think of much more local, you see the labour market is much more localised. So mm -hmm. in terms of the boundaries for social mobility, you know, in some ways you kind of experience a larger geographic labour market as, as you progress up that skill level. And that varies a lot by other socioeconomic characteristics too. But I think with both of those in mind, a job of a CA is to kind of cater for that multitude of different levels within an individual place. I think another dimension to that is if you look at within the WMC area, and this is not just a feature of us, but how labor markets work. So we, we we have multiple functional economies within the WMC area, which basically means if you are in one of the three formal left areas, which is where the data exists, roughly one in four people will work somewhere else in a different left area. So you have this extremely like, strong movement people across the region. Which is why the role of the CA is to say, you know, the economy does not stop at an administrative boundary. People's living standards are really interconnected and bleed across mm -hmm. local authority boundaries, which is why, you know, the, the recognition by government over the last uh, 10 or so years of the, the kind of that level of devolution. So you can look at, you know, the interconnection between local authority areas and then tailor your funding, which, you know, is significant in our case. And, DFB has been really ahead of the curve by where the devolution of adult education it should be commended for that. Uh, but you, you kind of you need to look at geography and the economy and the labour markets kind of at those two spatial levels, but ultimately at the broadest level, so you can capture all essential interconnections. It's interesting though that the movements you tend to find, those big movements of people, tend to be more graduate types of people. Uh, over in any sort of form of distance. And one of the worries that we have as a social mobility commission is that those at the bottom, the most disadvantaged, disadvantaged find it much harder to make them those moves of any distance. So there, and they, that's why many of them stay rooted uh, mm -hmm. to the bottom with the, the worst jobs. And we need to find ways of getting around that. Yeah. I think public transport is a much underestimated policy lever on social mobility. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're hearing. Um, whenever I speak to colleagues from the West Midlands, we end up talking about public transport. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think it's great that we have as much fine grained data as, as we can get. I think what we really care about is tackling that barrier, is saying, okay, we can actually make life better for businesses if we can give them a broader range of possible skilled staff and we can make life better for individuals, if we can widen their horizons, uh, I've I've seen this in real time. What happens um, when people uh, when their options expand? You know, I've seen different improvements in public transport in Merseyside, and each time people feel their options expanding in terms of the jobs that they can do. Mm. We've got a particular challenge, I think, in some of our cities where um, you know we historically northern cities in particular have been like. Um, you know, have slum clearance in the 60s, heading it out to the edges and to big estates on the edges of cities. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find a way to reconnect mm -hmm. those areas back in with the centre to make sure that we're all the time broadening people's options and that they can't.
I think that is a really good point. And if you look at different places within England for a second, if you looked at, for example, West Yorkshire or the West Midlands, we're quite similar in terms of our drug. You haven't got, like in London and Greater Manchester, a singular dominant economic entity that pulls people in. I think there is often an assumption within some policy circle that the roots to regional economic growth is that um, let's just agglomerate a single economic entity and then that is the solution to how you do it. And I think from a West Midlands, we absolutely want and need to see an economically thriving Birmingham. But just the way labour markets work, if you are in Dudley or Solly Hall and you need to be accessing economic opportunities, you know, you can't just say get on the train and go to New Street and then work in the job. It's a very localised picture, which are we work with our local authorities and are working with them now to say, what does a player-based economic strategy look like below the sub-regional level? You bring together the multiple different funding levers that we'll have through the single settlement, but also through the investment zone, through growth zones and business rates retention. What does that look like at the sub-regional level? Because we do know that you know we need to drive burning and some people will access that opportunity regionally and nationally but you know we, we exist for the whole of the three million people and even the economic camps that speaks to that you know diverse our people experience the economy um that's a kind of nice segue to the question i have so i'm going to ask one more question um i, I could go on all day but i will let this i know there's a lot of other people who i'm sure have thoughts so please sharpen your questions i'll come to you all in, in, a, in a minute um, but just pick up on the thing that you said, uh, Ali, about um, a growth plan for, for, for every part of the UK. Um, Labour is obviously big on industrial strategy. And one of the things about strategy is you've got to, uh, you've got to choose what you're not going to do as well. Is there, is there prioritisation or trade-offs? I mean, certainly I've been in conversations and uh, Jonathan might break your heart a little bit here, where they said, well, we've got, we've got one world leading city in London. We can maybe do Manchester. Uh, what Birmingham had a push, um, and it's really kind of and and anything beyond that is uh, is trying to bite off more than we can chew. So I don't know if I can break confidence, well, thoughts, but there are but, but but let's say economists, I will say. I mean, okay, well, a lot of economists think a lot of different things. So um, I think um, I think that's the wrong way of looking at growth, um, bottom up and middle out is the right way to think about growth because it's much more secure economic growth if everyone feels the benefit. Um, you, you, we, can't, we can't afford just to have a kind of like top heavy um, economy. It's got to be for everyone in our country. So I sort of, without going too far down the rabbit hole of like, Because I know what it is like to grow up somewhere where people say that this place is done, it's over. That's not fair. So even if places change, I mean, I think about coastal towns, even if places are going to do different things, and I think it, we still owe exactly. everybody in our country that sense of being part of a plan that is for a country called. You know, I, I think the agglomeration effect is real, right? Cities exist for a reason. But from a public policy point of view, I think you've got to consider every part of your country. And I think that isn't just say every place needs to have the same economic plan. Yeah. That every place has equal opportunities in every sector to do this and the same. But the idea of casting some places adrift, well, I, I, I think if you looked at the impact of employment on people's health. Do you really want to say you're not going to address the greatest determinants of, of individual health by just leaving some place to capital places to And we'll let others argue that, but in, in some ways, I think the West Midlands kind of isn't really waiting for someone in London's yeah. judgment to say, you can, you've got prospects or not. You know, we are already cracking on with it and kind of the kind of support of central government in enabling us to go further is very, important but you know for Birmingham there are people there who are you know really keen to support the future growth of the city and we back them uh all the way to the West Midlands and uh, work with them very closely so you know we would just get on with it because we know that you know whether it's knowledge intensive business industries whether it's the fact that you know one in every four car parts is made in the UK is made in the West Midlands you know we, we kind of know what our strengths are we know what our strengths aren't 
And I think that is very right. You have to be able to make strategic choices. Um, but I would say, you know, the enabling framework that government can provide to help us close what is around a twenty-eight billion pound productivity gap in London, you know, we we need to crack on and we will do that. But it's about us being ever less selective and then understanding what our strengths we can play into. And uh, as you say, what are the the, the castles, the cathedrals in the desert that we should avoid? Great. I think uh, actually what John says is right. There there are areas that are much better at converting growth. Than other areas, and it's to do with local strategies partly. Yeah. I mean, we, we again did some research in our State of the Nation report about which areas were um, indicating signs of growth. And uh, we built this sort of research and development composite index, which included three main things. One was business expenditure on, on R&D, one was university research students, and the other was broadband speed. And it was quite interesting to follow the areas where that was the case. And they tended, they tended to be this sort of arc from Bristol to the west of London. And areas like Derby and Nottingham and some parts of the West Midlands were also in that. And on the other hand, the areas that didn't have that were much more rural coastal regions that were very much clustered around the west side of, of the country and indeed northern Scotland. But, Going back to our conversation before we started, Aberdeen wasn't included in that because obviously that has a uh, special uh, oil and gas uh, things going in its favour at the moment. So, so the, the pattern that these main, main locations had was that they had major universities and they had clusters of high tech and engineering firms around them, which were hubs for innovation and implementation. So one of the lessons we can learn is that innovation industries coupled with universities and, and the right skills do make a massive difference great uh, i'm sure everyone has lots of questions uh so do put your hand up and uh you know, might take it might take a couple and uh, yeah, jump in the front uh, thank you very much yeah uh, welcome to the field director of the community fascinating conversation so far um so thank you very much for for this event um, just to stick on the, the regional side of things, I don't completely agree with everyone that's been said so far, but just to get your views on the role uh, regional mayors, you know, play in, you know, you've seen the likes of Andy Vernon and the street and really championing their regions and how do you kind of get regional managers to, to continue to champion that across the country? Um, so that's the first question. And the second question is just around how do you incentivize businesses to you know, global national businesses to invest in places that you know the places that need that investment, but they might not currently have a place based approach there to uh, incentivize them to invest in those places. I mean, we've seen the likes of PWC and the work they could they did in Bradford. But how do you get more employers, more businesses to take that approach? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm Rory from Nationwide, and thank you for uh, it's been really interesting. Um, they have a building site, so I'm going to talk about housing savings, and then uh, building sites have been in for several centuries. And I just want to get in terms of you on the importance of housing and savings to promote social mobility. They provide a 5% net, 5% stone, um, and we really need good policy in place uh, alongside education, alongside skills, and all these other areas. Great. Um, I'm going to add on uh, a, a pen to question to the to the question about business incentives, which is a couple of people online have asked, what can businesses do? What is what should businesses be doing in terms of things like outreach activity, recruitment, um, and uh, I, I guess a corporate social responsibility more broadly? Who wants to who wants to go first? Oh. Sorry. Okay. So um, on um, regional mayors and so on. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't credit Lloyd Osborne with much that I agree with, but when Merseyside was put the opportunity to have a combined authority and a mayor, we grabbed it with both hands because we wanted a chance to run ourselves. Yeah. And I think Steve Rotherham, I mean, this, you would expect to say this, does a great job. Uh, but part of the way in which he does that great job is as, is as you described it, which is that on a national and often international stage, he is able 
to put forward the case of Merseyside, Liverpool City region, and we're lucky enough to be a place that it turns out people don't mind coming to. So, um, so I think that that model does work well. It's not perfect, but I think it does work well. I think that if we're all thinking about plans for growth, then I think having that focus and that shared, the social capital of having a shared plan, you know, can really help businesses because they can be a part of that um, and feel feel strongly part of it. And some of the best businesses that I've been lucky enough to speak to recently have been talking a lot about the social mobility challenge and their role in addressing it. I think there's incredible innovation going on that the government could really learn from. People, simple, very simple things like taking schools off CVs or maybe not even asking for CVs. You know, I've spoken to businesses that recruit now by asking people to make some video content mm -hmm. for them, um, which makes me sound like, you know, I'm trying to feel hip and down with the young people. But the point is, that is a more relevant skill for them than the ability to write a good CV. Mm -hmm. So I think innovative businesses are doing good things. There's a question, I think, for government about how to transfer some of that knowledge. Um, no doubt, maybe the Social Mobility Commission might advise. Um, and on, on the housing and building societies point, you know, I think we could have one of these sessions basically on, on just on housing and social mobility. I think it's sort of staring us in the face, really, it, it, partly because it stops people moving. Um, and I, I agree as well, you shouldn't have to move to have great opportunities. You know, of course, we all change jobs and move around. That's a good thing. But you shouldn't feel like your only hope is to leave the place that you love. Um, and, you know, the, our housing situation is, is a real barrier to that. Um, and, and on the point of, about, about savings, you know, well, let's, let's get, get into this conversation because I think, you know, following the sort of abolition of the Child Trust Fund, we've never really picked up again the idea that actually it, it, does, it does make quite a difference to people if they're, if they're able to save and we all, we all want that in the future. Um, I think building societies, along with credit unions and some of those, can be a really strong force for good. So, yeah. SMF, do more sessions on social mobility. That's, <laughs> that's my conclusion. Very happy to. Uh, Jonathan. I'm happy to. Um, really good questions, all. I would say, obviously, you will think I am biased on the question of the role of vision institutions. Um, but I've actually worked in the kind of central government end of devolution and the local government end. And I think we would, I think most people who are in this space know, you know, institutions are very able to do lots of things. They are kind of a panacea to say, devolve it, everything will be much better. There is a certain enabling environment that can be created that gives it the best shot, but there is so much variation uh, in, in the evidence. But it is, you know, if you kind of look beyond some of the aggregate studies that look at do, do institutions at the regional level make a difference, and we could do things like produce an employment and skills strategy that came out uh, last week. Uh, mm -hmm. Helpful to have that handy. And it enables you to say, how can you bring together the things that matter to social mobility within a place in a way that it's just very difficult for you know, central government to do. So if you look at, you know, the other education budget, skills boot camps, free courses for jobs, careers, employment support, ETSPF, the list does go on considerably further, but they are all very kind of different in some ways but they shouldn't be because they're all speaking to in places labor market needs and through the single settlement that we're negotiating with government we ought to have much more trust and flexibility and responsibility to say here are the outcomes you need to then tailor the outputs to the things that matter to your economy and we will hold you to account for them but the kind of you have demonstrated and they mentioned 700 billion pound investment in our education since 2019 that we've got a track record but how can you really tailor that? And it allows you to do things to the question about transport to say, well, we know transport is an important part of how people access adult education. And that's why we spend some money in, in terms of making sure that, that accessibility is there. But I think the additional role of the institution, it allows you to say, well, what are the things that beyond quantitative statistics are really making a difference to people's experience? So for example, we've heard, you know, it's quite some folks can be intimidated by getting on the bus at certain times. We've heard that, you know, women who are going out in the nighttime economy, there is a safety issue there. And you think kind of qualitative things that are difficult 
understandably for a national institution to pick up what they, they can be picked up by a local institution. So we kind of, you know, we, we do deliver big funding streams, but also being able to pick up on what are the actual micro level factors that are maybe stopping people from being able to get a job, from being able to get into work, uh, and ultimately having the flexibility and competing power to do that is, is where we can go a little bit step further. I would address you the two questions because I'm sure you're very good to hear from uh, Robert. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, well, I'll just comment on, on the first one, which was the uh, the devolved stuff, because it's clear working with government, local leaders can make a, a huge difference to what's going on in those areas. And Alison cited and Steve Robin, but, you know, there are other good examples in the West Midlands. Andy Street has made a huge difference. Andy Burnham has made a difference in Manchester, and you could go to the northeast as well. So those... Those sort of mayors have done um, a lot to, to get move things forward, um, and we we've got our own sort of connections. In we we work with uh, the sort of local authorities and combined authorities, and we take regular feedback. When I was chairing a meeting only a, a week or two ago, uh, with representatives from from all those pretty much all those bodies on it, and so we 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 do understand what what the advantages are, but. Don't think devolution is a silver bullet mm. because these are very, very complex issues and there's there's a lot more to it than, than meets the eye. But we do need to do things like build capacity within local authorities and combined authorities, um, mm. help with the resources necessary to help local officials understand and utilise the, the powers that, that they've been given. There needs to be a clear workforce strategy within those uh, local authorities that have given these extra powers. And there has to be assessment and evaluation of all the policies. I mean, one of the, one of the things we want to see running through everything is when is upskilling all points in, in the in the in the sort of power arm of things that we do from uh, parenting early years through schools, uh, colleges, universities. Being able to show the upskilling that you've had at each of those those sections is really important. So you, you need to be able to assess it, to measure it, to understand it. And so that's going to be the same with the economics of local devolution as well. Great. More questions yourself. Thanks. Um, Richard from the Prince of Trust. So um, the transitions net zero and growth and green jobs should potentially be quite a large opportunity for social mobility because of the locations where we know these roles are going to be. However, it could be a potential threat because research we've recently done has shown a real lack of awareness and in knowledge and interest in these roles from young people at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and that is especially the case amongst potentially disadvantaged young people who see these roles mm -hmm. as the science graduates. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure it's an opportunity? Lewis. Thanks, and really good discussion. Do this from all sets of colleges. So, rightly, we do focus on reclaiming the reskilling of adults, so that's a really important part of it. And of course, that takes funding. Um, and I suppose, Jonathan, I think a slightly more critical picture of how the last 10 or so years has been. We've seen a massive decline mm -hmm. in funding and adult education and training, 50% of the time in adult education, which means in Western Sense of Command, there are opportunities. You're kind of working with your hands behind your back, and you've got more powers over the time in the budget. So the bit of the budget we haven't discussed today is the apprenticeship levy. Um, well, we've got some analysis coming out next month that shows, again, that's been a real failure. We've seen a decline in the number of apprentices, we've seen a decline in the number of apprenticeships, and a particular decline in apprenticeships in the most advised parts of the country, um, as well as a decline in, in key priority sectors. And I suppose that suggests that putting money in the hands of employers and letting employers just use it as they would is quite risky. But I suppose how am I meaning to levy differently, more purposely to tackle some of the things we've been discussing it? And what powers might there be to devolve some of that money for regional interventions in the way that we've been discussing it? Great. I'll take yeah. another one from online, uh, which basically says that there's some analysis to say, well, I mean, I, th I think we can tell from the from the stagnant kind of economic growth that essentially social mobility is more zero sum now. There are fewer, we're not creating so many. Uh, well-paid positions or better-paid positions than, um, than 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 people's parents. Um, so, how far do we need to be thinking about social mobility in somewhat zero-sum terms, sometimes in somewhat redistributory terms of opportunities? Um, and the example they gave as a as a policy might be something like uh, the restrictive admissions code of Brighton's um, school lottery or flirtations with with school lotteries. 
Um, anyone want to pick up on any of those questions? So I go with young people. Yes. Uh, because I think Richard, you you ask a really really uh, important point about the potential for what you might usually call work in the new economy. I mean, we can think about green jobs, but also the creative industry, for example, which creative industries is something that Britain is great at. It's a growing area, like the world is content hungry, there's a lot of opportunities there, perhaps more seen as more like attractive by young people currently. But um, I don't think that young people are generationally like averse to engineering. I think that something there's something else happening um, and the Resolution Foundation produced um, some interesting research this week on um, where young people are at and the growing number of young people who are not doing anything. And I refuse to use the word neat because it's like other, but like young people who have got issues with mental health problems and the challenge of that combined with economic disadvantage. Again, there are big geographical points to be made here. Um, it, they've done a lot of analysis on where the biggest challenges that are that we face. And you can see the compounding effect of um, having had poor attainment at school, um, having lived through COVID and the mental health challenges that that produces, and then being in a place where public transport is really not good either. So I think that we've all got collectively some work to do to help um, the next generation coming forward. And for some young people, that is the work that Princess Trust does really well, which is confidence building and um, and about opening up the idea of opportunity um, where perhaps for different reasons that's been shut down. Um, we are trying on Ladies Front Bench to work right across different departments, health, home office, DWP, education, to think about you know young people where they are and to build an idea of you know um, another word I hate pubs <laughs> but uh, you know we we want to have more mental health support available you know in a way that young people could just walk in and access that but also building in the role of FE colleges um, and the work that DWP already does for young people so we're thinking about how how can we make that work best on a kind of sure start. Um, principle. Um, and I, I think that can help us to meet the challenge of the site because it's about supporting young people with the problems that they've already got, but also helping them to see the opportunities that might be there or might be coming. Um, and yeah, and so I would fit apprenticeships into that vision, really. Um, we've got to be clear on what the data is telling us about where those opportunities are available. And as part of every place that growth plan, they should be thinking about um, apprenticeships, it, it sort of slightly drives me up the wall when we have a kind of really bifurcated view of like it's university or apprenticeships, because, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of businesses, they want to bring young people into their um, profession or into their company. Actually, an uh, apprenticeship route is a really great one, but it doesn't preclude somebody doing a degree later on, just the opposite, in fact. So I think we need to rethink the message there, and I take the points that you've made about it. Mm -hmm. Um, strategy and so on. There's, there has got to be a, a much clearer plan. Um, really good questions on the net zero elements of the economic opportunity. I, I would say it's um, for an institution to be able to know, similar to what we have just spoken about, what its existing assets are and what the big threats are within the economy. So within the West Midlands, for example. Uh, the, our colleagues in Coventry City Council and, and others are seeking to develop the, the Coventry Giga Park uh, in Wolverhampton. Colleagues are trying to define and progress the Green Innovation Corridor with the levers from a range of sources. But I guess the, and there are other initiatives at the regional level, such as the energy capital partnership we have with, with industry. I think the trick is to know where there is demand within the region, but then also from a social mobility perspective. And then within the same four walls to have your access to skills needs as well. So there is that just instinctive dialogue between what are the, the sectors that are emerging and then how do you then reflect that as much as possible in the skills levers that you have uh, and in a way that can be used uh, consistently across the variety uh, of funds that exist. And I would say to the point about uh, the levels of education, but I don't think we disagree that, you know, we have quite 
range of significant challenges. You know, half of all vacancies in 2022 were defined as hard to fill. That's not to say we job done it anywhere. There is much more to do with and funding is a key part of that. But I would say they could have been able to do more with what you've got and get more value for the local labor market of people, making it more relevant to student is, is, is a positive step forward that we have seen. Uh, but I, I would uh, dissent from the, the principle of what you said. I think the question of, you know, social mobility being a, a zero sum game, uh, I think that this is one that I think would okay, ignite a lot of debate amongst the sociologists and academics over when we have seen the greatest inclination in social mobility nationally it was actually when the post-war period there was a significant increase in structural change in the labour market. That's not to say that you, know, you can't have social mobility in a very tight economy where there isn't structural change, but just that where we have seen kind of huge economic growth. We haven't seen that. Uh, we have seen that lift all boats to an extent in, in the post. Obviously it's a different circumstance, but I think in, in, as well as what we saw in Ireland in the late 2000s, that was also similar. Um, so it's, I think they're uh, two, yeah, two different caveats. I mean, on the uh, stagnant economic growth and trying to take the positive out of it, I mean, we've had this period since 2008 where the economy, the economy hasn't really grown very much at any point, and that's partly because of the massive heart attack that took it, took place in the economy in 2008, and the subsequent heart attacks that have taken place with COVID, the Ukraine war, the energy crisis, and all that sort of stuff. So there are a series of things that have badly affected the economy. And I think we can we can all uh, agree with that. But there are industries that, despite that, that have either done well or are doing well, and they tend to be. The more innovative industries and i would i would say that but they're not doing well enough if i were to make one criticism of a policy um across numerous governments in the last 30 years it would be on competition policy i think that and this is me criticizing it um i'm not sure the smc is quite right at this point yet <laughs> but but uh, there is there there are there are innovative companies that enter the market that aren't getting very far because they're being forced into mergers and acquisitions and, and those sorts of things and it's affecting the market so there are these huge companies that are dominating sectors that don't have the same impact on social mobility that entering innovative companies have and i think that we need to have a broader understanding of competition policy from just what the price of something is, which is really what dominates it and what market share a company has. You have to look much further because just looking at those, it's discouraging uh, new entrants to come into the market. It's discouraging R&D investment in the market and it's threatening competition. So we, we, need to, we need to have a good look at that because that is something that could make a real difference if we could have a broader number of companies entering the market, employing people, because the evidence is beginning to show. So it's entrant companies that aid social mobility more than the incumbents. Shout out for the Competition and Markets Authority's <laughs> recent report on employer concentration and the effect on the UK labour market published last month. I would recommend it as a reading to everybody. There you go. Rob and I are fellow CMA geeks. <laughs> Monopsony. Um, so we are coming to the uh, the end of our allotted time. So I'm, I'm just going to give everyone uh, a minute or so just to just to sum up. Um, and in particular, um, what do you think the kind of actions to take away and to direct them at direct, direct them at central government at um, combined mayoral authorities? Uh, and particularly, there's a lot of interest in business and third sector and what what, what can be done to uh, to address the issue of social mobility and uh, kind of rebalance the and regional policy. So maybe we pick, pick one action for someone and uh, and um, to, to kind of end the discussion and just jump into another place. If I actually think, think you all very much for your questions that do come over if you've got any further thoughts or reflections as a comma if you're really interested in things you might not have touched on or but you might have a difference of view. But I'd say uh, overall, I think um, to the point made earlier about evolution not being a silver bullet, we could be doing a lot more with a fully integrated employment and skill system on the skills end of social mobility. I think that isn't about spending lots more money. It is about recognising that if you want to bring together at different stages of an individual's labour market journey, the relevant support, 
beyond skills and looking at mental health and health too, uh, which we've done some work on through the Thrive at Work programme in the West Mids, then ultimately that is a difficult job for any national institution to do, but it's it's something where a combined authority, working with local authorities, can start to stitch together. So just from the employment and skills side, I would say, you know, that isn't a kind of huge fiscal injection, not the the point you made, which you agree with, but it is about making the system working better and delivering more results, so delivering better as a result. Awesome. Um, I would love the opportunity to reform job centres so that we can turn them to face employers more and the kind of permanent box ticking that goes on and really think about how we can look at a place and <laughs> see the jobs that are coming and help people find the jobs that are really going to help them rise. Brilliant. Anyone? Final word. I, I think my... My broad point would be uh, to ask people to think more broadly about social mobility. Put your baggage to one side and almost forget everything you've learned about it in the past. Think again and think about what the evidence is telling you about where to go on this, because it's the evidence that will, will be the telling factor in making the right policies and coming up with the right solutions. Well, we are, we are not going to disagree with uh, evidence-based policy here at the Technocratic Social Market Foundation. <laughs> um, so uh, all that, um, oh, that's, that's us at half two, so that all that um, is left for me is to say um, thanks to Apana for some um, thought-provoking and thoughtful uh, contributions. Thanks to so many of you for coming out uh, and watching and engaging with your, your great questions. Um, and yes, uh, I'm sure we can get Ali along for some more conversations about the mobility, seeing as there's clearly market demand so <laughs> thanks everyone and hope to see you again soon